The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Let's go back to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. We're looking at verse 23 tonight because <clears throat> Tuesday and Wednesday now we're in the same Hebrew book because I closed out our study on the angelic conflict. And so I'm going to work Tuesday and Wednesday to complete the book of he uh, our chapters 8, 9, and 10 of Hebrews on the subject of the new covenant. Here we are on the, the, pre the new covenant priesthood of which every believer is a member. You become a, a royal priest at the point of salvation. It's one of the status privileges if you're familiar with that. 50 things you receive at salvation you ever lose in time and eternity. And for those who are visiting with us on the internet, you can go on to our website and you can pull down the 50 things and study them yourself. But we're talking about the priesthood today out of Hebrews 10, 23. Um, at the top of your paper that um, we divided Hebrews 10, 25 through 15 should be 25. <laughs> that would be a 25, not a 15. We don't go backwards. <clears throat> Except... For me, I told them this was my last birthday. And they said, well, what, what do you mean it's your last birthday? I said, well, from this year backwards, I'm counting a year back. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so next year, I will be one year younger. So Pam asked me how long, what age did she think I would be when I died? And I told her 40. You can put that on my tombstone. So all my kids, I think, have taken me seriously, and I won't have a tombstone. But if I did, they would put the date I told them to put on, going backwards. <laughs> well, anyhow, um, make sure you have, we're in a, we divided chapter 10, verses 22 through 25 into three parts because of the hortatory present subjunctive. We explained that last night when we did the first. Um, so let, let, me, let me remind you, I put on the top of your paper, let me remind you about a s subjunctive for a moment because we have three of them and they carry the weight. Remember that, remember now that the 10th chapter, verses 19 through 25, is one Greek sentence. That makes that important. We talked about the importance of that last night. Um, but it's subjunctive. This is taken from uh, our, our Greek grammar book that we study, Summers, called The Essentials of New Testament Greek, from page 107. I thought I would take that because many in our church take Greek or have taken it, and this is a page number that you'd be familiar with. The subjunctive expresses action which is not really taking place, but what is objectively possible. You always want to remember that about a subjunctive. They're talking about something that's, that's, that is not really taking place at the, at the time, but it's objectively possible. And what that emphasizes, and this is important to you, what that emphasizes is volition. Volition plays a key role in the subjunctive. Uh, there are two things in the Greek that really emphasize uh, volition as far as uh, a mood, a subjunctive and an imperative. Now, when you add the hortatory to the front of that subjunctive, you will find it in the words in the English, let us. For example, look at verse 22, let us. Verse 23, let us. Verse 24, let us. See that? That's a clue that you're dealing with a, a hortatory subjunctive, which means that let us is first person plural. Notice I wrote on your paper from the same grammar book, the hortatory subjunctive is the use of the first person plural, I put down let us, to exhort. Now, this is important. 
to exhort others to join us in an action. Are you with me? That's, that's let us. So when you add, so I wanted to, because we run into hortatory subjunctives quite a bit around here. Um, so it's kind of good to know that. So th this is, when he sets this up, he sets it up as a sequence, and, and we kind of look for this stuff, don't we? And at least in this church, we look for markers within the passage, things that are repetitive, things that are emphasized, things that stand out. Now, this kind of stands out by itself, doesn't it? I mean, just in the English, let us, let us, let us. I mean, that's a whole lot of lettuce. Everybody's eating salads, I guess, but that's a whole lot of lettuce. And... Um, but in the Greek, that's even more powerful because those, there, those of us that have taken just simply first-year Greek knows about a hortatory subjunctive. Uh, so I wanted, but, I, but here's my point. I thought it would be important for me to tell you where I, where I get this stuff, okay? And maybe most of you go like, well, I don't care, Ron. I know that you studied all this stuff, and that's okay with me. But the people on the internet may not know. And so by being able to tell them where we get that stuff, and, and, and if they want to follow along sometimes, they can get this little book or, or just get a first-year Greek grammar book, and this will tell you that's not going to change. <laughs> this is just the book we use in our School of Biblical Theology. Now, so I wanted to explain that. And so we're running three studies because it's about our priesthood. Look at verse 21. In verse 21 of this passage. Well, I'm going to have to look. I didn't bring my paper. In Hebrews 10, 21. Let me get, let me get Hebrews. Let me get it. Let me get where you are. You're in Hebrews 10. And we're looking at, look at verse um, 21. See where it says in verse 20. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, over the house of God, and, he, and who, is the, who is the we and sense we have? Well, that's the believer, the, the new covenant believers. Church, we call them church age believers and new covenant believers. This new covenant idea. Our, our great priest over the house of God is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, this is about priesthood. It, it, the, the subject is priesthood. Let us draw near. Uh, let us hold fast. Let us consider. See, those are all present subjunctives. In, in the text. Now, last night we looked at verse 22, and and uh, um, notice what we notice. We last night we talked about the triad of new covenant virtues, the triad, and and they're mentioned all over the scriptures. And you always look for them. They're as popular under the new covenant as the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that any times you find those three listed somewhere, that's a big deal. Or if you ever find them, all three of them engaged in one specific act, that's a big deal. Like creation or regeneration, all three are, all three are. And so the triads are important. So I wanted to point them out. So look at where it says our three, our three studies. Let us draw near, verse 22, let us draw near with full assurance of faith. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love. There are your three triads. Remember when we studied them last night, we looked at other passages. The most famous passage is 1 Corinthians 13, 13. But they're, but they're, they're often found, and when they're found, you ought to pay attention to them. And so these are your triads of new, new covenant virtues. These are, the, these are the virtues of your priesthood. These are virtues. These are, these are divine virtues. These are not human virtues. These are divine virtues that are in our mortal being because of taking in the word of God by being saved by grace, be it operating in the Holy Spirit by grace, operating by faith by grace. I mean, all of that. Um, tonight, we're, we're taking a look at the idea of hold fast the confession of our faith in verse 23. Let us hold fast, I'm reading, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And that's the second of the three 
hortatory present subjunctives. Okay? Hold fast. Now, this word hold fast is kind of interesting. I think it, it's understandable. You got to hold something, hold fast. But uh, let me tell you when that becomes, let me tell you the condition in which the writer wants you to understand. Hurricane Florence goes through your area. High winds and a lot of rain. And that hurricane comes in off from, with pretty good speed, comes into land and just sets, which it happened, didn't it? It just sets. It dumps so much water so fast, there is no way. I mean, if you're there when that thing comes and sets, you're cooked. I mean, you better find some high ground somewhere, and it better really be. It amazed me when they said that some places the water level would go 32 feet above norm. 32 feet, that's, that's above a three-story house. As a, I mean, where are you going to go? I mean, that tree, I mean, you, a tall tree, yeah. If you got one near your house, wait till the water gets there and you'll be up three, three stories on the tree. You won't have to climb, just reach out. But here's my point. This word hold fast, this word hold fast or, or uh, uh, what it has, listen, it's not hold, hard to hold fast to something when nothing's happening. But you get really highly motivated to hold fast when you're a hurricane running 100 miles an hour, setting a place and dropping water at unbelievable speed on you. Now, holding fast. And so you see a lot in that story coverage, you see a, a lot of things happening. People are holding on to trees and branches trying to survive it. They're, they're holding on to how, tops of houses. Um, now you got an idea of what the writer says when he says hold fast. It's not hard to hold fast when everything's going good and if there's no really, you step outside and you say, I wish there, I wish there was a little breeze. It's not hard to hold fast, but when you got a 100 mile wind, trees are going by your house. Man, 100 mile wind, now hold fast. Now here's my point. What the writer's trying to tell us that we need to learn this because other people need to learn it and the and priests are the ones who tell them. We tell them in love, we tell them by faith, we you know, we go we we encourage hope. Okay. Now, the truth of the matter is that's where your great ministry is. People who are holding on by the by the skin of their teeth as they say. People who are so desperate, they're just they're hanging on by their fingernails. You know, there are all kinds of cliches for it, isn't there? This is where we have great ministry to bring into the subject of hope. Because listen, l listen again what he says. And this is, this is the great ministry we have to people. People who don't need to, ho they're holding on, but they're doing, I'm holding on, but I'm okay, I'm doing well. We have a ministry to them. We have a love ministry to them. We have a faith ministry to them. We don't have a hope ministry necessarily, but those people who are out on the edge of existence, those whose life is in peril, or those who believe their life is in peril, the one thing that we can give them is hope. Now, this hope that the Bible talks about is really interesting because it's not like the hope, a hope, a hope. We're not talking that kind of... This, this word, elpis, in the Greek language means confident expectation. Confident expectation of what God's promised he will do. Confident expectation. That's elpis, E-L-P-I-S. And it's a powerful word. And we don't have anything near other than hold firm under all conditions of your life. Hold firm firm hold fast or hold firm that's the idea here so let's look at three ideas today this is the second function of the priesthood and it involves hope 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 in the second lesson point one in the second lesson the writer instructed members of the new covenant priesthood 
regarding their second function as priest of the Lord Jesus Christ, our great priest. And he uses the word hold fast. It's a present active subjunctive, of course, hortatory, first person plural. It means to hold firmly, and it means to hold on no matter what the circumstances show you. And you can hold on with confident expectation because whatever God's promised you, he will do. That's why the word of God is so important. How do you know what the prom well, how do you know what God promised you? His word has to tell you. That's why the Bible is so important to study. In fact, most study Bibles, someplace they'll have a section called the promises of God, and they'll they'll mention a lot of biggies. Do you? The word hold fast, now look what you're to hold fast to. Watch this. The confession of our hope. Isn't that interesting? I, I'll tell you, I would have never thought to put that there. That's how important this triad is. And it depends on which one is needed, which one's important. Because when Paul was talking in chapter 13, it, it doesn't, he doesn't mean that love is greater than faith and hope. It means it's the greatest to be exercised with spiritual gifts. That was his subject matter. And that was their problem. Whatever one of these is the greatest is the one that's most needed at the time. Whether, whether it be love or hope or faith. That's why the triad virtues are so important with the priesthood. There are times when love is the key. There are other times when hope is the key. And there are other times when faith is the key. Okay? And we're going to talk about that tonight. He says, let us hold fast the confession. The word confession is what we do. We use 1 John 1, 9, homologeo, the verbal form of this. And it, and it, it always means the same thing. This is a noun here, but it means the same thing. It means to speak the same thing or be in agreement with. To speak the same thing or, or to be in agreement with. That's, that's this word. And there's a definite article with it, which is of importance to us. Hold fast to what? The confession of our hope. The confident expectation. Now, what, where, where, what's our, what, what is our confession based on? It's based on the word of God. Because that's where our hope comes from. The confident expectation that what God has promised you, he's able to. Now, now let me give you a verse. I want you to put your eyes on it. I want, you to, give you, I want to give you Romans 4.21. I want you to put your eyes on it. Now, keep your place in Hebrews and just back up a little bit. If you, if you haven't memorized it, I quote it so much, you've probably memorized it, right, Fran? Yes. What's it say? In, in Fran's terms. Yes. Being fully assured yep. that whatever God promises, he's got the power to make it happen. Yeah. Or to perform. Yeah. Yep. Yep, to perform. He's able to. Listen, fully assured. Have you seen that word before in this study? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Yeah. Verse 22. It was dealing with faith, fully assured. You see, fully assured in your faith is what brings out holding fast your confession no matter what's going on in your life, the confession of our hope. And listen, not only is that important for you to know in your life as your life gets turned upside down in this crazy world, but the friends of yours and the people you know, the people that God brings into your six feet of space need hope. But they don't know what it is. They don't know what it is, and so it's our job to explain it. They don't know what it is. You, well, you need to have hope, and they think, hope, 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 I'm running out of hope. I'm running out of hope. You can't run out of hope. You can't run out of love. You can't run out of faith if it's in the right thing. The object is what produces it, right? What produces faith? 
What produces hope? What produces, listen, it's the same thing. The same object is what produces the word of God. And what stands behind the word of God is the character of God or the essence. And, uh, and listen, here, here's the problem with our priesthood function. Listen, you got to be patient with people. And listen, I'm telling you, because I'm the world's worst on patience. I mean, I'm short on that end. But I shouldn't be because it's the fruit of the Spirit. And I had to learn that. I had to learn that in my nature, in my flesh, I'm short on patience. But I can be long on it if I'll trust the ministry of the Holy Spirit because it don't come natural for me. It, it goes the opposite way in my life. I mean, let's get it done. Let's get it done. Let's get it done. Let's get it done. And uh, that's, not always, that's not always the best choice. Sometimes you can get ahead of the... You can get ahead of the thing, can't you? You can't drag your feet on the back side, but you can't push too hard on the front side. And uh, I don't have a problem dragging my feet on the back. I have a problem with pushing too hard in the front. And so, you know, it's all about perfect timing and being able to understand that. And so I've had to learn in my life, I've had to learn to push back on all that, that a person, what they call a personality, uh, to temper myself. And the only way I can do it, because my flesh is, it gets running. It just wants to go. And so I've had to learn how important walking in the spirit is. Now that should be true in whether I don't have it or do have it. I should always walk in the spirit. But I'm just, I guess it's kind of in my priesthood is confession. I guess going on here. I don't know what's going on here, <laughs> but stop it, Ron. Um, but anyhow, the confession of let's hold, let's hold, what are we holding firm to? The confession of our hope. All right, so our work, notice there's a definite article with hope. As long as confess, see, you don't have to do it. If you put a definite article, and the English didn't, if you put a definite article with the first, with confession, you don't have to put it with hope. And they didn't, but they should have, <laughs> even though it sounds funny, the confession of the hope. But they're separate and yet attached. The idea is confession is one thing, confession of hope is the other. You can, confess, you can use confession a lot of different ways. Well, confess your sin, right? Confess your identity with the Lord. Now, a lot of ways, and so they put a, one on the front telling you confession is important, put it on the backside, this is, and hope is, and make sure you understand what I mean by confession and make sure you know I, you, what I mean by hope. By putting a definite article, I'm, for, I'm forced as a teacher with a definite article because definite articles in the Greek are big. I mean, I, I had to tell you how big they are. They're big, big, big. All right, so let's hold fast the confession of our faith, of, I mean, of our hope, the confident expectation of the faithfulness of God to what he's promised. That's what, that's what it means. That's why the definite articles are. That's what it means. The same object, the word of God on the character of God works in all three of these. Confident expectation of the faithfulness of God to what he's promised. Now, now watch. Here's a key word without wavering. One word in the Greek language. One word. And I put it on your paper. See the A in the front of that word? That's an alpha privative. That's without. It means un or without. Without wavering. Without wavering. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to talk about that in a moment. Uh, without wavering. So if you're going to hold fast, here's three things. See, here's three things. Here's three things. Look down below. He said, for, for he who promised is faithful. See, I crossed out the word is. You know why? Because that's not a, there's no main verb. This is a one sentence. There's no verb there. Is, there's no I me. There's no verb there. So I marked it out. And 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 pistos, p i s t o s, it's a predicate adjective. It's a predicate adjective. In other words, it's acting. It's acting. It's an adjective which is describing he who promised. Actually, what this says is is you could do it backwards with it. I wrote it the way um, faithful is he who promised. See, you have to put the is in there. It just doesn't make sense in the English without it. 
but it's not there in the Greek. It's, and it's definitely not there. And when it's not there, then you, you have to go like, what's he talking about? He's telling you that the promise is based on the faithfulness of God. Do you understand that? The, the, see, it's used as an adjective, but works like a, a, a predicate. It's, it's kind of unusual stuff, but we're in a long verse. We're in a long sentence. And you, you can't have is. So that's interesting. A he who promised is faithful, or faithful is he who's promised. The word faithful is used in the most unique way to describe the, listen, it's a predicate, it's a, it's a predicate adjective. The adjective describes he who promised. The predicate part of it points to the importance of the action of it. <laughs> let me, let me explain. He who promised. The promise is what stands behind our hope, right? Look, let's hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The word faithful shows you that whatever the promise is, God is faithful to fulfill it. See, that's Romans, that's Romans 4.21. And the emphasis is on that. Your hope is on the promise. The promise is on the faithfulness of God. See that? And listen, it's not complicated. This isn't, this is 101 theology. This is not complicated. This is how that thing works. And people, whether they want to believe it or not, it's their business, but you got to explain it right. Because what they need is hope. And our priesthood is able to do that with them. We can explain this to them. Are you with me? All right. Now, what we saw is we have three functions. See, we're talking about the function of the priesthood here. Hold fast. Hold fast. I want you to say hold fast three times. Hold fast the confession of our hope, the confident expectation that God is willing and able to do what he promised. Hold fast without wavering. Now, this is an interesting word. Remember, I have alpha, on the, alpha primitive on the front, the A, without, and then the word wavering. Now, what this, word, what this word means, it means I'm talking the opposite. Watch this, what I wrote. It, I'm talk, when the writer uses it, it means I'm talking about the opposite of leaning forward. The opposite. In other words, if you're in a strong wind, what do you naturally do? Lean forward. This is leaning backwards in a strong wind. Now, what, what's going to happen to you? Well, yeah, a lot quicker than if you fought it. I mean, you can see, again, when the guys were out there, why they, why they put these guys out there in that kind of storms is beyond me. That's the, just for a little bit, uh, that's crazy. That's great. Put a camera out there or something. Leave the people alone. I mean, that's crazy. And you see these guys. You know, a girl would be nuts to go out there and weigh 100 pounds, would she? I mean, she'd be fish bait so quick. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. But when I saw that, this is this word where these guys are hunkered down and their pants are blowing and their hair, you know, and you go like, and they go like, how high is the wind, brother? He it says, it's the 35, 40 miles, but the hundreds coming. I think, boy, you guys are nuts. They, they pay you that much? You couldn't get me out there? Well, anyhow, hold fast the confession of our hope Hold fast without wavering. Another way of thinking this would be unstable, unstable. If the storm has got you unstable or, or doubting would be another idea, wavering. There are a lot of ways to look at that. And then hold fast. See, the, three, see the, the point is let us hold fast in it. What do we hold fast? The confession of our hope. How do we hold it without wavering? And why do we hold it? For he who promised is faithful. Right? And, and, and that's all there is to that. Oh, you think that's just all there is to it. That's all there is to it. The rest of it is let God have it. Right? Yeah. That's what, what is hope? Confident expectation of what God has promised. He is faithful to fulfill it. So when the storms of life come, you just lean into them. Let God take care of them. Huh? 
All right, point number two. Okay. Without wavering. The new, the new covenant priesthood is encouraged to function without wavering. A good example of this in the doubting idea, which most people have, they, they more go mentally against this stuff, is Thomas. You remember Thomas in Acts 20? Remember he said, if I don't, if, if I don't, put, if I don't touch the nail-scarred hands and put my hand in the side, see, which, which get, gave us as theologians ample proofs that all that went on in the cross, doesn't it? People go, oh, you don't really think they did that. I don't know. I don't know. Thomas, Thomas talked like it was, he was a reporter, right? It was, he, could have been, he could have been sent out on Channel 6, <laughs> 7 or whatever that is anymore, without wavering. And Thomas, did, Thomas was wavering, wasn't he? In fact, what, what's Thomas? He got a nickname from this. Yeah. <laughs> Poor guy. He had a nickname. They stuck him with that. We talk about, I'm in the 21st century, and I call him Doubting Thomas. He must have been in the military because if, you, if, if you're in the military, they, they tag you with names. They do it with officers, Rick? They tag you with names? No, big shots. <laughs> Let me tell you, down in the ranks they do. I had a name from basics I never got rid of because I moved latrines <laughs> because I thought that that sergeant didn't know what he was talking about and I found out it don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and I moved latrines until I obeyed. I moved latrines. And I got a nickname that stuck with me through my first two years, my only two years. Thank goodness it hasn't stuck anymore because I don't do that. But I, 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 hold, I hold fast the confession of my faith, my hope. Well, anyhow, Thomas got this name. You can see, if you want a good illustration of what we're talking about, Thomas is an, at least an illustration of one. Holding fast to the confession of our hope is based on our absolute confidence in the integrity of the character of God, i.e. the essence box. I want, you to, I want you to do something. I want you to do something. You know the symbols for the essence box? Put them, put them on your paper a minute. Just write them down. Just do, put, the, put the symbols. You know the symbols. Somewhere on your paper, you got room on your paper to do that. Yeah, O, 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 that's the way I learned them. There's, there's the first half, right? You put those? Right? Omni, right? Omni, right? Omnipotence, omnipresent, omniscient, uh, omnipotent, uh, omnipresent, omniscience. Immutability, veracity, uh, plus R. I put plus R plus just justice, and uh, sovereignty. Sovereignty, uh, eternal life, love, and for me, I put holiness. Because I found out when I began to study Greek on my own, they were the same thing. It was a, it was a nickel with the heads and tails. So, I don't put those two down because I don't have to. So it gave me an opportunity to emphasize the holiness of God. We're to be holy as God is holy. So I found a whole other link in that. And I'll tell you why I did that. Because, and this is not all there is of God, is there? No more than 50 things of salvation. We put them down there to get you started. <laughs> that's a starter kit. And, and let me tell you, that's a pretty powerful starter kit. Because when we talk about when we talk about the faithfulness of God, this is the stuff we're talking about, how that, how that faithfulness of God works in our life. If he has to bring uh, omnipotence, he can bring that out. The God, confident expectation of whatever God's promised, he's able to do. And I could be in the storm of my life and it could be blowing me all over the place. And yet I know that God is capable of doing it. Jesus believed that when he was on the, in a boat on a storm. 
stormy sea. All right? He tried to teach his disciple, there is no storm that's not good enough for that. So that, that's, that's the kind of stuff you should look at. When we talk about the, when we talk about the integrity of the character or essence of God, this is what we're talking about. And you, you need to know some of this stuff because this is the stuff that actually, when it comes out into the application of our life, this is stuff that comes out. That, that's, pretty, that's pretty important. The believer priest must trust in the character of God no matter how the circumstances of life look. Because we don't walk by, we walk by faith, not by sight. It doesn't matter how it looks. Our hope can carry us through because it's in, right? It's in the character, it's in the promise of God and the character of God. He's faithful to that promise. And listen, all these years, he's been faithful or he had been exposed by now. <laughs> he's been in my life. I didn't, take, I didn't take him for granted. He'd been there for me because he was promised his faithful, and he? Who promised his faithful? Faith is the veracity. When we look down here at veracity, This is really important. This is really important to a person uh, that has questions, like Thomas. Well, unless I, unless I say I won't believe, and Jesus said, well, blessed are those who can't see and do believe. <laughs> I don't know if they got that either, but we'd, we should. Faith, <laughs> faith in the veracity or the truthfulness of God gives the believer priest the confidence the, that gives him the confession of hope, confident expectation. And this is, enables him without wavering, without wavering in what God has promised. Now, here are three key verses on God cannot lie. God, God is veracity, cannot lie. Hebrews 6, 18, Titus 1, 2, and Numbers 23, 19. Numbers 23, 19 is the most interesting because it comes from the second oracle of Balaam as a universal truth. That really makes that interesting. If you're familiar with that, uh, that would be Balaam's second oracle would be 23, 18 through 24 or something. God cannot lie. It's a basic character of God. Now, here's our final point tonight. Paul used Abraham. Paul used Abraham's working through his struggle with God's promise of a seed in the midst of child barrenness to teach you and I how to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Paul devoted the fourth chapter of Romans to it. That's a lot of print for Paul. So I want you to go over there and I want you to show you some things that now I, we're not going to read the whole thing, but I, I want you, I want to give you, I want to tease you to read it later. I, I hope I can do that. Because this fourth chapter is really a dynamite chapter. In the, in the first 12 verses, Paul argues the law works versus the promise and grace. And Paul is going to argue that the law produces works and the promise produces grace. And he says the promise and grace are greater than the law and works. He's going to spend 12 verses on that. That's a lot of verses to fight that argument. When he writes to Galatians, he covers it in a few verses. But here he, he spends some time with it. And from there he moves to the position of the promise of God operates different than the law. He shows you how it operates different in verses 13 through 15. And this is well worth your read. Uh,
okay? Then in verse 13, Paul says, for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that, and here's the promise, that, I, that the word that it identifies the promise, that he would, Abraham, the promise, that he would be heir, listen to this, of the world, was not through the law. How do I know it? Because the law wasn't written yet. The Mosaic law, we're talking about Mosaic law, wasn't written yet. I mean, we're, we're 21, 21st century B.C., 20, 22nd century B.C., somewhere there. The law is not going to be till the 15th century. With the Abraham and Moses business. The promise of Abraham to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And he's talking about the promise given to Abraham. Now, Abraham uh, wavered, didn't he? We, we know the story of Abraham. Listen to what Paul, Paul said. And I'm just, I'm just jumping around on this because I'm trying to teach you to read the whole thing. I don't have time night, tonight to go through the fourth chapter of Romans. That would probably be I don't know how long it would take me to go through Romans <laughs> because everything is so important. I just can't leave anything out. For this reason, for this reason, it is by faith. See, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just pressing you on some points. See? But through the righteousness of faith. For this reason, it is by faith. And watch this. That in accordance, so that it, it may be in accordance with grace. See that? Law can't do that. So that, the promise will be guaranteed because grace brings God in to do what he's promised. You don't have to do what he promised. You have to believe that he will do what he's promised. Come on now. That Abraham got out all screw in his head. He got that screw in his head and God had to be patient with him and work him out through that just like he does you and I. Isn't God wonderful? Now don't say God, I love you. He's got a patient. He's got... The, to all the descendants, listen, God treat, treated them all the way. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and down the list we go. Not only to those who, now watch, here, here, he picks us up. Watch, we're, we're included. Listen, not only to those who are, are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. That's, that's at Galatians 3:26 uh, through 29 where every Christian is brought in through Abraham, through the Abrahamic covenant, where Jesus Christ fulfilled it. Therefore, the covenant is fulfilled with us. Whoa. That's so good. So good. Listen to this. Here's verses 19 and 20. Even though I'm, my subject is hope, it's built on faith. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, Now as good as dead, what it, what's, what, how old is Abraham according to that word? You know when he got to promise? What age he was when he got to promise? 75. Yeah? 75. He's just now got it after his contemplating his body dead sexually to produce a child and his wife Likewise, are you with me? That this whole thing had to be by God and God alone. Now he has a confession of hope that he didn't have. It took him 25 years to work through some gobbledygook. Now, I don't know where you are in your journey. I don't know, maybe 25 years is like God goes like, hey, that enough's enough. Let's get this. I don't know. But he let him go and worked with him till he got him to a point there is no other way it could be done but except by grace. Are you with me? And when he did it, it produced faith. To the promise that he'd given 25 years earlier. Now, God shouldn't have to do that with us. We ought to be that willing participant like Mary was 
when the angel come to him and said, Mary, I got a mission for you. She hears it and goes like, I don't know how that's going to work. And he tells her and she salutes and says, got it. May it be done to me according to your will. That's what God wants out of us. You don't take 25 years to get there. It shouldn't take you 25 years to get there. But listen, if it does, God is patient. And it's not how long is that you get there. Mm -hmm. The quicker, the better, however. The quicker, the better. Look at the misery they went through. I mean, 25 years and all that happened, all the, the and look how many other people got caught up in this snare with them, huh? Hagar, Lot, his right-hand man, trying to make them all fit where they couldn't fit, you know, uh, put in a square and a round hole, whatever. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated, listen, it took him 25 years to get there, but he got there. Come on, people. He got there. And listen, once you get there, you go like, why did it take me so long? And the, right? And the question is, look, don't take that long anymore. You go like, well, I don't have much more. Well, that's okay. <laughs> I would have liked to have done this when you were 70. I would have liked to have done this when you were 25, but you didn't, you wouldn't listen. But you're listening now, and I love it for that. That's, that's God's attitude. I love that attitude about him. He goes like, look, don't even look behind you anymore because it's all what? Gone. I remember it. I remember it. What, right? He looks back, and he goes, hey, what are you talking about? Well, I, I just uh, stop that. You're looking forward because what's behind you has been all cleaned up. It, all your past has been cleaned up. Isn't that wonderful? Now, people remind you that it's not. People will come into your life and remind you it's not, but you go to the word of God who says that's not true. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Don't believe it. I remember your sins no more. Right? What a wonderful verse that is. What I heard. As far as the east, as far, yeah. As far as the east is from. I don't know how far that is, but it's a long way, isn't it? It's a long ways. I'm not going to walk it. I'm not going to walk it. I have no fire. We got out now to put out, 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 well, anyhow. Um, Romans 4.21, which we spoke about. Now, now listen to what Paul says in, in verse 4.18, which is important in our study. In hope against hope, he believed. In hope against hope, he believed. So that he might become the father of many nations. Do you know what? Now, he never lived to see this. Did he? Never. But we have. We've seen, we, we've lived to see it. We've lived to see that the Abrahamic covenant key person was the Lord Jesus Christ who has become that. We have lived to see this. He didn't. You know that John 8, 50-something, Abraham longed to see our day. He longed to see it. I mean, he thought, it, he thought Christ would come in his lifetime. He thought it would be one of his kids probably. Well, maybe, it, you know, the seed was important, right? It was the eminence of his coming. They believed it all the way through the chain of, the chain of uh, genetics. You know, when I first got saved, almost all the preachers I ever sat under closed their service by, by saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I haven't heard that in a long time. I don't even say it myself. I believe it. But, I, but they all would close the service that way. Do you, anybody remember those days? Well, I must just had some pretty good guys. Uh, come I said, it, I said it quickly, and I can't remember it now. <laughs> well, others have heard it, too. Well, I don't hear that much anymore. I, I don't say it much anymore, but I do believe it. 
But I remember the guys I sent her used to always say it as they closed their service. Um, but if they believed it then, boy, think how close we are now, huh? In hope against hope, he believed so, so that he might become the father of many nations according to what had been spoken, quote, so shall your descendants be. What a, what a wonderful thing. And, of course, that all, all fulfilled through the, the point of the Abrahamic covenant, which was the seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, Galatians 3.16. Sarah, I love Sarah's role in this in Hebrews 11.11. 11. Sarah, by faith, Hebrews says, by faith, even Sarah herself. Listen, Sarah got it at the same time he got it. Ding, ding, right? Listen, by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive. You know how? By the power of God. How do I know it? Because it happened even beyond the proper time of life since, right? She, she was sexually dead. They were both, quote, sexually dead. I'll let you know when I get there. I don't know if it's at 100 or not. No, I probably won't let you know. Thank you. <laughs> Pam says, spare me. Spare me. Uh, Sarah, by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, sexually dead, since she considered him faithful. Listen to that. Listen to me now. Since she considered him faithful. You know what that is? That's hope. That, listen, listen. That's her. Listen to me. It's her confession of hope, isn't it? Is that not confession of her hope? It's a confession of her hope. That's what we're talking about. And the, therefore, the big point tonight is God is faithful. And listen, we have a great priesthood ministry in the confession of hope. People that need hope, we have a confession about it. We can give them the confession of our hope. And that is the confident expectation that what God has promised, he is able and he is willing and he will do what he's promised. And we, we, we place the emphasis on God's ability to bring grace in the most impossible situations. Like Abraham and Sarah at 100 years old. Brought all this stuff. and her testimony, her confession of faith was she considered him faithful who had promised. That's that's good stuff. Yes. <laughs> well, we ought to get him <laughs> that's what a t shirt. You, know, you, you, you were talking about how. The yeah. In the army? Yeah. Well, you got I, one. I didn't have to join the army. I still got a, still got a name. I guarantee you they do it in football. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They give you nicknames in football. Yeah. They do in manual labor, too. They probably don't do it upstairs, but in manual labor, everybody gets one in manual labor. When I worked for Pipeline, when I worked for Southern Natural Gas Pipeline, they didn't know my name from the army, though. <laughs> they gave me a whole new one, thank God. Yeah. That they didn't find my old name. <laughs> Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and the internet. We pray, Father, that they, those that have traveled with us on Tuesdays have switched over as well onto Wednesday as we complete our study of Hebrew uh, 8, 9, and 10. What a wonderful study this has been, Father, on our priesthood. A great emphasis on our priesthood how we minister to the believer, to the body of Christ, uh, how important it is, these, this tri of virtues and how they're to operate, faith and hope and love. Oh, Father, help us to be these kind of priests uh, to the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.